kind of coupling on to the message on hope, we began looking at the promises that Christ gave to the church, to us. At the conclusion of each of the seven letters that were written to the seven literal churches in first century Asia Minor, we see that that Jesus gives specific promises to the churches. But these promises are not limited to the churches to whom they were sent, but rather are extended to include every single person who overcomes. Jesus says that he will give things to him that overcometh. Do you recall that two weeks ago? We took some time to consider who it is that the Bible says will overcome. So that we might know to whom these promises belong. Who is it that overcomes? Well, we saw a definitive statement that was given by the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5 and verses 4 through 5, which reads this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith in Jesus Christ, putting our trust in him, secures our victory. The one who overcomes the world are they who have put their faith in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Those without faith will suffer judgment at his hands. But to them who have run to him for refuge, for salvation and grace, he has promised life and eternal blessing. By grace, through faith, we obtain victory over sin, death and the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. So these promises that Christ writes at the conclusion of these seven letters extend to all those that have put their faith in him. These promises are ours if you are in Christ as well as every single person in the body of Christ. We looked at two of the promises. I might just remind you of them that we looked at. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. And the other one was in verse 11. We looked at these two promises. He that hath an ear, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life that was created for man to eat, we lost the privilege and the right to eat of it at the fall. Lest man in his sin live forever and be sustained through its healing properties. And we considered how because of what Christ has done, he brings it full circle. That which was once denied is now will be freely given to us to partake of. And we even saw later on in the book of Revelation, in the description of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, we see that the tree of life lines the waters that run from the throne, giving 12 manner of fruits each in its season. We will be able to partake of that freely. We also see linked to that, that that promise of the tree of life we see in verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We saw that the second death refers to the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. The ones whose names are not found written in the book of life are forever cast into the lake of fire. A place of conscious eternal torment. And just judgment for our sin. This is the fate of all those that have not overcome. Who have not trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But for the one who has, they needn't fear that judgment. They cannot be hurt of the second death. We had a look at those two. This morning I'd like us to look at another two. That really speak of the same thing. 
But before I do, and before I go to the portion or the promise that Christ has given, I'd like us to establish some context. Now, the context that I'd like us to establish goes all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. A promise that God made to David. It is what we call the Davidic covenant. Turn with me, and by the way, just as a fair warning, you're going to be doing a lot of turning. Okay? So get ready. If you're using a digital, get your thumb ready. If you are using your Bible, which I would prefer, okay, get you to know where everything is. Be ready. Because we're going to be turning to a lot of places. Turn with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. God establishes an unconditional covenant with David. It's unconditional in that it isn't dependent upon anything that David does. Or what his descendants do. The promise is established here. What God will do for David and David's house. Look at verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers... I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom forever. I mean, immediate application is the, the immediate son of, of David who will inherit the throne, which is Solomon. He would build the temple. And so we see that, but notice that, that the promise then extends beyond you know, that throne of Solomon and throne of David. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So we see the promise here. Your house, your lineage, would be established forever. Your throne and your kingdom will be without end. It will be an everlasting kingdom. But if you know anything about Israel's history or anything about current affairs, one will know that the throne of David was vacated during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Because of Judah's idolatry, I mean, even because of Solomon's idolatry, the kingdom was split. And then the idolatry of Judah over a number of successive uh, number of kings, 20 kings in all, we see that God brings judgment through Nebuchadnezzar. And the time of the Gentiles begins. And during that time, the, the, the throne of David has, has been empty. However, the promises made to David are not void. I mean, we have a look there in Israel. Who's leading Israel? Well, there's, they've got a cabinet. The prime minister is Benjamin Netanyahu. I can assure you he's not of the house of David. He's not sitting upon the throne of David. Does that mean that the promises, the unconditional covenant that God made with David is void? Not at all. Not at all. Because the one who would fulfill it of the house of David, you know well. In fact, coming to December, we read a portion of scripture that we, we know very well. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, for unto us, a child, a, a, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. To order it 
and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Notice that this one, the child that is born, the son that is given, he will order and establish it. He will establish that kingdom upon the earth. Now put a little bookmark there in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I want you to go, how do we know that this is Jesus that it is speaking of here? This child born, a son given. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 30. Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. Here Gabriel has appeared to Mary. Verse 30 it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Who will fulfill the Davidic covenant, the establishment of that throne in that house forever? Here, Jesus, he will order and establish it. Notice that the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus fulfills the covenant that God made with David. His throne and kingdom will be without end. He will reign over all of Israel and over all of the earth. Upon this earth. While the throne is vacant at present, it doesn't lack someone to fill it. The issue is just a question of timing. Where is Jesus right now? He's on the right hand of the Father. In Psalm 110 verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, it's a question of timing. Sit at my right hand, until the appointed time, and I've made enemies your enemies, your footstool. The time is coming when he will establish his kingdom upon the earth. This passage in Psalm 110 and verse 1 <clears throat> is quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 32 and 36. Turn me there. You're there in Luke. Might as well go over to the other book that, that Luke wrote. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32 Notice what Peter says there. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 verse 32. This is how Peter ends his sermon. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore... Being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. <coughs> Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ? What does the word Christ mean? That means Messiah. It's the Greek form of the Jewish word Messiah. And it means anointed one. There are three offices which received anointing. Prophets were anointed. High priests were anointed with oil, and kings. 
Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Christ is exalted and sat down at the right hand of the Father, waiting the day appointed to bring judgment upon his enemies and to establish his king upon the earth. But there's a statement now, going back to 2 Samuel. Remember, I asked you to put that bookmark there. 2 Samuel chapter 7. There's a statement there within the covenant made to David that is, I think, one that is overlooked, but is incredibly important. And we find it essentially in the first part of verse 14. But I'm going to read verse 13 as it speaks initially of Solomon and the house that he will build. Notice what it says there in verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. I want you to, how much when we're thinking about the Davidic covenant, do you reflect upon that statement? Probably not that much. You probably have thought just mostly about the throne and the kingdom. You know, in the house that he has promised to establish. But there is a promise here of adoption of the, of the Davidic king. That there is a sense in which this Davidic king will be established or begotten. He will be my son. And I will be his father. There is a begetting here. He will be mine. He will call me father. I will call him son. And we see this, this promise that, is, that it, it's not just uh, geared towards Solomon, but ultimately through the Davidic line to the ultimate one who will fulfill this promise. This promise is given to the descendant of David in the context of establishing his throne forever. Notice that it says, and I will establish his thro the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. You know, in Psalm 89, turn with me to Psalm 89. We see this declaration of God's promises to David. In fact, within the psalm, the psalmist is lamenting the fact that it seems that the house of David has come under judgment and the call for the Lord to remember his covenant. But Psalm 89 we know that this is referring to David. Look at verse 20. Psalm 89 verse 20. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. David's in view here. And according to the, the covenant that God has made with David. Look at what it says in verse 26. He shall cry unto me. Thou art my father. My God. And the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my, what? Firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. You see, that establishment of that throne, together with that identification, I will be his father. He shall be my son. Within the context, we see that David is in view. But it is ultimately fulfilled in the descendant of David, not in David. This aspect of the covenant, the begetting of David's descendant as a son in the context of establishing his kingdom upon the earth, is applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. We read it as part of our scripture reading this morning, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1, and if you recall within the context here, the context is the Son of God, through whom all things were made, who has been appointed heir of all, the firstborn. Of all creation. And that's not talking about first created. But rather the one who will inherit it all. Look at what it says in verse 5. 
Notice that he quotes two psalms here. Okay, no, beg your pardon. He quotes one psalm, and then he quotes the Davidic covenant. He quotes one psalm and the Davidic covenant. See what he says, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's from the psalm. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Where's that from? That's from the Davidic covenant. That covenant, the descendant of David, I will be his father, he shall be my son. And it is established with that other song. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten. We know that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. But what is in view here is the exaltation of the Son of David according to the covenant that God made with David. The day of coronation. The day in which he is exalted and lifted up and authority given. The day when the descendant of David is exalted by God over the kings of the earth. And begotten as God's son. The author of Hebrews links this statement when he says, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, with the exaltation of Christ. Notice you there in Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 5. So also, Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Can you see the link between this statement, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, and glorified. Paul links it in Acts chapter 13 and verse 33 with Christ's resurrection. And exaltation, seated now on the right hand of the Father. This is where we see Christ rose from the dead and was exalted, being seated on the right hand of the Father until the time appointed for the establishment of his kingdom. Remember what Jesus said before he gave the Great Commission. All authority has been given. Therefore, go unto all the earth and make disciples. All authority has been given to me. This statement, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, is found in Psalm 2. And I want you to go and have a look there with me, Psalm 2. And you're probably thinking, I thought we were looking at Revelation. We are. (coughs) There is something profound here. The men, and I had a look at this a couple of weeks back, but I want us to have a look at Psalm 2 here. Just reflect upon this wonderful song. Because actually, when I have a look at this, and what is said in Revelation, I actually can't believe it. It is, it is beyond extraordinary. It is beyond extraordinary. Look at what it says in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? That is plot. Okay, that's the idea. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The psalm begins with the nations of the earth, the kings of the earth, plotting against the Lord and his anointed. Within the context, it's the anointed king. It is the king who has been promised, according to the covenant with David, that his kingdom will be without end. That it will will expand the entire earth. We'll see that within the context in just a moment. Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the one 
of God fulfilling all the offices of all prophet, priest, and king. But here within the context, king. Look at what the Lord's response is to the plotting and the schemes of man. I love this, by the way. You know, please understand, the nations will plot. The nations will scheme. The nations will go against God. Ha. But the end is so assured. You can't get away from the judgment that will come. Look at what it says. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Not a laugh in humor, but one of derision. The Lord shall have him in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. We see, while the schemes of man are made against the Lord and his anointed, it is the Lord who will trouble them. He will mock them in their folly and bring his wrath to bear upon them. And he, the Lord then responds with assurance. What does he say? After all of them have done their scheming and plotting against the Lord and his anointed, verse 6, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I have set my king. The king the king speaks. In the verses 7 through 9, the king now speaks. The one whom the Lord has set on upon his holy hill. Look at what the king says in verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me. This is the king speaking now. The one whom the Lord has set. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. <laughs> Notice, from the psalmist, the psalmist is talking about the Davidic king that will come. We know who that is. But here we see here, this is a messianic psalm that is looking ahead to the Messiah. And here we see this begetting of the son of David. Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And the context is the establishment of his kingdom. Ask of me and I will give you the heathen as your inheritance. All the earth will be yours. Such incredible dominion is his that it's described that thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Such is the power that you will have. This is given to the Son. To have kingdom without, without end. The Father bestows to the Son. I will be his father. He will be my son. And his throne and his kingdom I will establish forever. Can you see? How does that fit with the promises made to the church? Oh, it's phenomenal. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 26. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now that word power means authority. The right to rule and govern. To the one who overcomes, who's that? The one who has, accepted, has, given, has, has um, trusted in Christ. Who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. Remember? Who is he that overcomes the world? The one who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. And here Jesus is speaking now. And he says, and he that overcomes, 
He that overcomes, which we understand by faith, the same, I will give power and authority over the nations of the earth. Isn't that quite something? Look at what he then says in verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Now let me just stop right there. Who was that applied to in Psalm 2? The son. The father gives the son. This day thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Ask of thee. And I will give you the heathen as an inheritance. All the nations of the earth, you shall rule them with a rod of iron. And as a potter's vessel, you shall break them into shivers. Who does it apply to? The son. That Davidic king. The Messiah. The Lord's anointed one whom he has set as a kingdom without, without any end. What is Jesus promising here? The one who overcomes, the one who comes to him in faith, I will give you authority over the nations. You will rule with a rod of iron. As a potter's vessel, you will break them in pieces. Notice what he says in that very last phrase. Even as I received of my father. Isn't that incredible? You see Jesus saying, I have received of my Father power over all the nations, a kingdom that is without end, forever and ever over all the earth. And to the one who comes to me in faith, I give what I have received to you too. Isn't that mind-blowing? Because I understand that the Son deserves it. But I certainly don't. I certainly don't. And yet you see, the Father gives to the Son, and the Son gives it to us. What? What? That's incredible. That's incredible. The same thing, interestingly enough, is pictured in Daniel chapter 7. Oh, by the way, before we get to Daniel chapter 7, I'm going a little bit out of sequence in my notes. But have a look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 21. Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. This is a very similar. Notice what it says. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. You will sit with me on my throne. Why? This is seen in Daniel chapter 7. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 is the passage that Jesus quoted to Caiaphas before the Sanhedrin, that if you were, if you were to say, was the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were, when Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man coming with power in the clouds and glory. And they knew exactly what he meant. That he was the Messiah. That he was the one who would have the right to rule and his kingdom is without end. They understood and they tore their garments and said, Blasphemy. This is what it says in Daniel chapter 7. Look at verse 13 and 14. This is all future. This is something to come. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, that is the Father. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Let's be clear. 
There is one everlasting kingdom that has been promised. And that has been to the throne of David. Who is the son of man here? The son of David. He is the anointed one, the Messiah of the house of David, whose kingdom will be forever, coming with power and glory in the clouds. The Father bestowing upon him all rule and dominion. But what's incredible is verse 27. Verse 27, look at what it says. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, what? <coughs> Shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. You see, that Son of Man is referred to here as the Most High, whose kingdom is without end. And we see here, it is given to the saints. And within the context, that is enormous. Because within the context that speaks of a ruler that will raise, that will come to power, the Antichrist, who will for a season be able to put saints to death. And yet, the promise is that as the Son of Man takes his kingdom, those very same saints will reign in that kingdom with him. We see that in Revelation 20. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, speaking of the millennial kingdom of Christ, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon him, upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received their mark, his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What? Lived and what? reigned within this world Jesus has said that we will have trouble but what did he say be of good cheer take heart have courage I have overcome the world and the implication is and you with me and you with me he has declared that the meek will inherit the earth how can he promise that because he inherits the earth and he gives it to the meek who wait upon him in judgment. They who have run to him and patiently wait upon him, they will be exalted and reign with him on his throne. To not be disheartened by what you see in this world. We may lose that <coughs> we may lose some battles as the heathen rage and plot against the Most High, but their end is assured and our victory guaranteed. The day is coming when we will be exalted with Christ and be given by Him authority over the nations of His kingdom. You will reign over His kingdom. You know, I mean, it makes the statement all the way through, I'm just going to read Romans chapter 8. You don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter 8. Notice what it says. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and what? Joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. That's what we're seeing here. The Father giving the Son the promised kingdom without end. And that being passed to the saints to have dominion. You know, back in Genesis, man was to have dominion over the earth. Remember that? Let us make man in our image and let him have dominion of all the created. That was lost to an extent. We now have the God of this world, our adversary, lost to some, some, some degree. But here there is a promise. The scripture reading today was Revelation chapter five, uh, chapter 4. But Revelation chapter 5 
is a great one because you see the saints praise the Lamb. They praise Jesus. Verse 9 and 10, it says, And they sung a new song, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Incredible promise. We do not need to fret. The victory is ours. One day you will, as a royal priesthood, exercise dominion upon this earth. But let me end with a warning. There in Psalm 2, there was a warning. Because I never want to take it for granted. What is your relationship with the Son? Psalm 2, if you remember, it begins with the, the heathen raging plotting against the Lord and His anointed. We then see the Lord say, I've set my king upon my holy hill, Zion. This day have I begotten thee. The heathen is yours. Your kingdom without end. Absolute dominion I have given to you. And then the psalmist comes back into picture. And he gives this big, fat warning to the reading. You know, to the reader as well as all the people of the earth. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with trembling, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest ye be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Oh, notice, what is your relationship with the Son? Be wise. Come to the King. Come to the Son. Humble yourself before Him. The ones who put their trust in Him, they are called blessed. Blessed, they will reign with Him. But woe to the one who does not... <coughs> Kiss the Son. Woe to the one who does not trust in Him. When His wrath is but kindled a little, they will perish. What is your relationship with the Son? Do you know Him if you put your trust in Him? You see, the wonderful promises are to Him that overcome. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. As He receives His kingdom, He bestows that to those who are his. It's crazy. That doesn't mean that he ceases to be king of all the earth, eh? His kingdom is without end, but we reign with him. What an incredible blessing. What is your relationship with the Son? But for the one who overcomes, he will grant us dominion over the nations. Let's close the word for it. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you. For the wonderful grace and the blessing that is ours through Jesus Christ. Lord, what wonderful liberty and hope that that gives us within the context of our world. We see much upheaval amongst all the nations of the earth. The changes of government and the threats of wars. None of that matters. None of it ought to concern us. For we know that the King sits at your right hand waiting. For all the authority and dominion to be established upon this earth. And Lord, we with him. Father, we don't deserve anything. Anything of the like. The fact that we have these promises and these, these inheritances given to us. Who have been given the right to be called your child. Is beyond our comprehension. For we are unworthy. Worthy is the Lamb. To receive all of this glory and honor. We are not. And yet you have promised and bestowed it upon us by your grace. Father I pray that you would set within our hearts. These eternal promises. That we would be careful to serve you as we ought. Set within our minds. The hope that is set before us. That we are not shaken by the things of this world. 
but as we are persuaded and convinced by the things that you have promised, that we would stand strong, steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Thank you for what you have given us through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.